talk about stream multiplexing in Go. Actually, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different instead, and we'll get to stream multiplexing. Actually, what I'm going to talk about is decentralizing the web. Again, since it kind of started decentralized, and then it kind of ended up where for pretty much all of our major services, we rely on very few providers. So your mail, like, it's probably Gmail, or your file serving, like, uh, if you want to host files to, to access anywhere, it's probably Box Dropbox, things like that. Um, and my question was kind of like, why don't we run our own versions of these? Like, why, why don't I have my own mail server anymore? Um, why don't I have my own Dropbox? Like, why, are, why is all of my data owned by other people? And there are some good reasons. Um, like, content is a good reason. Like, a lot of the media that's streamed to you are things that you don't own, things that you're renting. Uh, cost is another reason, right? You have to actually, like, own the, the hardware that runs if you want to run your own servers. And then, like, there's a giant amount of operational pain with running your own services. Um, and one of the major ones is deploying services. And so I, I want to talk about why that's a pain and, and how, uh, how that could be fixed so that we could decentralize things again. Like, I have the computing power to run my own mail server. Um, it's, I, I have it, uh, like I have so many old machines and all of them are capable of running like mail servers that are sitting in my apartment, but I can't run them. Um, which is, is kind of similar to this question, which is why can't I SSH into my laptop? Like right now, it's running an SSH server, but no one outside of, I don't know, people on whatever NAT Verizon has put me on can actually hit that port. And the reason for that is, is kind of embedded in this quote, which is what I imagined everyone was saying circa 2000, which is how do I connect more machines to the internet than my ISP gives me IP addresses? And the answer was, well, you stick a NAT in front of them. And so about 15, 20 years ago, the internet changed. The internet originally was intended for end-to-end -end connectivity between all devices. And at some point, we, real we realized that 4 billion addresses that IPv4 was not going to be enough, that we were running out of addresses. And so people kind of became stingy with the IPs that they were handing out, like your ISP. And so when you wanted to have multiple computers on your network, or businesses wanted to have like hundreds of computers in their offices, uh, but didn't want to pay for all the IP addresses for them, um, they turned to NATs. And they turned to them because, well, there weren't, well, IPv6 uh, wasn't ready. And deploying NATs is really easy. Deploying NATs is, it's unilateral. No one else needs the infrastructure around. No one needs any of the protocols around. You just like, you just drop a box in and it works. And one of the major problems, uh, so it was kind of this unilateral deployment thing. And the other kind of interesting thing to notice about NATs is that there's no standard, there's no API for them. There's no standard protocol for manipulating a NAT, for describing how it works. All of your NATs, kind of by convention do the same thing, but they don't always do the same thing. Some of them work differently. So we did that, and it got us to today. That plan actually saved us from, it wasn't even a plan, that's kind of the funny part, is it actually got us to today where we still are running all the internet on IPv4, even though we have far more uh, internet devices than we actually have IP uh, addresses to allocate to them. But it came with some costs. Uh, the, major, the major cost was that it fundamentally changed how we decide like, how the internet works. There's not end-to-end -end connectivity on the internet anymore. None of you can actually talk to this laptop right now. You can't actually deliver network packets to you, to it, unless I do some special thing to let you. Um, and that, that had all, so that's one of the costs and, and kind of a corollary of that cost is that all sorts of peer-to-peer -peer protocols became really, really difficult to implement. Um, like voice over IP, very difficult to do uh, when it's really difficult to get two computers to talk to each other because there are middle boxes, NATs sitting in the way. Um, 
And it also meant that all of the machines sitting in my apartment that are, are capable of running things like file servers and mail servers, I don't have public endpoints to run them. Like I don't, they're just sitting in my apartment. Like I can try, I can like log into my router and my, my NAT uh, and set up port forwarding to get those things actually running. Uh, and maybe I can do that, but the vast majority of consumers cannot. And it also means I can't SSH to my laptop. It's frustrating. So a related question is, how do I develop a service that receives webhooks from any API that delivers webhooks? Might not seem like a similar question to start with. Uh, it is, though. And so I built uh, ngrok. Um, it's a service that solves that problem. Um, it was originally a port of local tunnel, if any of you are familiar with that. Uh, I ported it into Go to learn Go. And the basic gist of the program is it establishes a secure tunnel from a public endpoint on the internet on a server that someone has, like someone has a server with a real public IP address, and it creates a tunnel that will take traffic from that it's, that's received on that public uh, IP and actually deliver it to your machine. So just as an example of what that looks like, if you download ngrok and run ngrok like port 1234, it'll create a tunnel where any traffic that it receives on some random subdomain on ngrok.com will be forwarded to your local port 1234. One of my favorite uses of ngrok though is I get support questions about this all the time, which is someone's like, how do I run my own Minecraft server? Because someone figured out that you could and put it on the internet and then lots of people became interested in that because it's a popular thing to do. And this is the answer. That's how you run your own Minecraft server on a machine, like on a machine in your house. But what if it were easier? That's two steps, right? That's like, yeah, I have, well, maybe it's three. Like, I have to install Java, and then I point it, and I have to find the Minecraft jar, and then I have to download ngrok and then run that to actually set it all up. But could it be easier? Could it be baked into Minecraft? where Minecraft already has this notion of getting a public address to serve on instead of being externalized to another program. And if you could do that with Minecraft, could you do that with all sorts of cloud services? Could you have your mail servers and your file servers and your media streaming servers all have this concept baked into them that instead of serving on a local port, that you could pass an option to say, I have a relay provider out in the, out in the cloud, right? who will actually uh, forward all of that traffic to me so I can list on, listen on public IP addresses, but I can still own all of the data, that all of, this, all of the data is owned on my machine. So what I ended up building was an API mm -hmm. for, for doing this, for tunneling in Go. Um, I built it for ngrok for doing the, the webhook sort of stuff, um, but I wanted to talk about the more broad, like broad implications of it. So this is basically what that API looks like in Go. It's simplified, but this is basically what it looks like. You dial some endpoint, and it returns to you a session object. And the session object gives you functions to listen uh, for connections. And the, the s things that the listener returns, or the, the listen calls re return, are tunnel objects. And you'll notice, for those of you who are familiar with the net package, that the tunnel objects implement net listener. So it lets you do some cool things. So this is how you listen for new connections in Go. You create a net listener, you bind it, you accept connections, and then you do whatever you handle each connection individually. Um, I'll skip that one. I'll talk about this one instead. Uh, this is, you should notice this is the same part at the bottom, right, that um, I'm connecting, I'm, handling each connection listening, or, and uh, handling each one. What I'm doing first is I'm dialing out to an external service and telling it to listen on port 9090. So instead of actually listening on my port, I'm going to listen on the port of another machine. Instead of binding to a local port, the, the Go Tunnel um, API is basically an API for listening on ports on a, a remote machine. So I'm going to actually do a little bit of live coding. So what we're going to actually do here is um, I've set this up so that 
basically anyone should be able to do this if any of you want to follow along on your laptops if you have them out. But we're going to actually write um, an HTTP server that listens on public addresses from this machine. So what I'm actually going to do to start with is um, create a really simple HTTP listener. I might have to refer to documentation for this, but I think we'll see if I remember it. Find a listener. Let's have it like listen on 5050 or something like that. And, and then let's see, I want to actually have it uh, serve on this. So if this fails, we'll like panic out here. And then I want to actually have it serve on that listener. And I guess I'm going to need some imports for this. So let's see, I need net and IO and that HTTP. What am I missing? Go import. Go import. Oh. Only cavemen type imports. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so close. So that, tell it that and handle. Yeah, I do tell what path, thank you. All right, pair programming. All right, so now I'm actually listening on uh, port 5050. Yes, we can uh, demo that. Oops, I guess I put it on 5051. All right, and then let's change this so that it's listening on a public address. What I'm gonna do here is use the library I was talking about. This is GoTunnel. And instead of listening uh, on a local address, what I'm going to do instead is uh, listen on uh, a public address. Oops. And then we'll just do uh, let us know where it's serving. So if any of you actually try that address, everyone here should be able to actually hit that URL. So that's the demo. That's where we get to actually stream multiplexing. Am I way over time? Am I doing OK? All right, let me know if like you need to like start playing the Oscar music or something like that. All right, so how that works is um, the way it works in, in ngrok today, because ngrok is doing something similar to this, um, is different. Uh, I wanted to rewrite that so that it was a library that I could share, so that people could build services that uh, just included a library and suddenly were available on any public, like on the public internet, regardless of where the device was that was serving it. And I was thinking a lot about how that would be most efficient. So the way I ended up deciding to do that was to uh, use stream multiplexing. The basic idea is you establish a single physical connection. In this case, the connection is from my laptop to a server, um, that, that you know, a hosted server in the cloud. And for every connection that I want to deliver to this machine, I create a single logical channel that runs over physical TCP connection. So there's one TCP connection, but there are many logical streams over it that are actually delivering 
the individual HTTP requests that are made up to, uh, to serve that page. So I just made one TCP connection, or sorry, I made one HTTP connection to actually do that demo for you, but you imagine if you had a page with like styles and JavaScript and all that other kind of stuff, you're actually dealing with multiple concurrent uh, incoming connections. So the basic idea with stream multiplexing is you split a stream, uh, you split a stream into chunks, you send each chunk over the physical connection with an identifier, and then you reassemble it on the remote side. This is the intuitive explanation. This is a conversation between two people in some sort of instant messaging program. There's a single physical stream. It is the conversation, and individual pieces are messages, right? Um, one person is talking, like they're talking about going like to the park, but also telling a knock-knock joke, but these pieces are interweaved, and your brain is smart enough to understand how to piece them together. You can reconstruct the two individual conversation threads here, even though there's actually only one stream of exchanged messages. That's the intuitive explanation about how that works. So every stream that has to be delivered to the other side is being split into different parts, uh, chunked up, and identifiers being attached so that uh, the individual streams can be reassembled on the remote side. This is a really old idea. Um, it's implemented in a number of protocols. Uh, SSH is, is one of them. Uh, there's, it's also, this is basically what the framing layer of Speedy does, is this uh, is stream multiplexing, and there are a number of old ones as well. Um, the original, like, we're going to reinvent HTV, again, HTVNG from 1999 or whenever, uh, actually had this idea in it. It was called WebMux then instead of Speedy, but it's the same thing. Um, and then even before that, that was like sourced from some older protocols. The other like sort of like major player in this space is SCTP. Um, this is an alternative to TCP or UDP. It's a layer three protocol. Uh, for my purposes, it's basically a non-starter because it doesn't work through NATs. Uh, NATs are actually rewriting the TCP packets that you send through. If you're using SCTP, it's not know, going to know what to do with them and basically just drop them on the floor. For this, for uh, the, the stream multiplexing that I wrote here, um, I didn't reinvent my own. I actually, I did a little bit, but mostly I stole it. Um, the stream multiplexing that's uh, employed in, in GoTunnel is basically stolen from uh, Speedy and HTV2. So that's what that header looks like. You'll see the stream identifier, the 31 bits. That's essentially what you use to chunk that's like the header on every message that you send through and the identifier is what lets you reassociate them on the other side. Um, the reason I didn't implement, like didn't build this on top of Speedy was that I felt it was too complicated for what I needed. There are a lot of different things in, in Speedy and HTTP2 that uh, like, yeah, there are a lot of different frame types and what I really wanted was just like the core, simplest possible thing to express uh, multiplexing streams, so you can kind of dig into the implementation uh, if you're interested, but these are like the core different types that are, core different set of frames that are used to actually do the multiplexing. And so I built it as a library. The library is on GitHub, it's called Muxadoo. Um, it is a general piece that provides you stream multiplexing in Go. Um, it's really great for tunneling, uh, that's what I use it for, for uh, Go tunnel and, and the next version of NGROC when I get around to building that into it. Um, the basic idea is every incoming physical connection gets matched with a every like public connection that a, like the public server receives gets mapped to a logical connection on the shared stream that's between the server and the client. After I built it, um, I also noticed that it's actually really great for RPC. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. First, I want to show you what the interfaces look like. Uh, if you actually use Muxadu, these are basically the interfaces that you get. Um, you basically have a way to take an existing net connection uh, in, in the Go world uh, and you layer on top of it a session. And once you have a session on top of it, you can open new streams, you can accept existing streams and, and close the session as well. Uh, you should notice that interface looks a lot like NetListener because it implements NetListener, so you can actually like wrap a single TCP connection and it then is then a NetListener that you can pass into anything that takes that. 
Um, and similarly, each stream uh, that you open or accept from the remote side, each logical stream, is also implements, uh, it, it implements net connection. So you can hand that around to anything that deals with net connections as well. Uh, really quick aside about RPC. Um, the interesting thing I found out about it is it's a really useful, uh, it's a really useful primitive um, for situations where you're doing RPC and you're like, oh well, so I have a lot of these, there are a lot of different types of services that have uh, the model of I open a new TCP connection and then I send across some sort of request to you and then it receives a reply. So examples would be like, I don't know, memcache, redis, SQL, like all these sorts of things. And if you want parallelism, parallelism out of them, you have to open up multiple connections. And so then like, oh, well, I have multiple connections. What do I do with them? Like I stick them in a connection pool. It's like, why did you do that? Like instead, if you had the primitives, what you could do is for each of those things that you wanted to run in parallel, you can just open a s new logical stream on the same physical stream. You don't have to deal with connection pooling. The overhead of these logical streams is very tiny, right? Logical streams are, they're just kind of incrementing a counter uh, for the different IDs that have to be kept track of. It doesn't actually involve provisioning anything in the kernel. Um, so you don't have to deal with pooling, all that other kind of stuff. I kind of think of it as like a parallel uh, to thinking about uh, user mode threads instead of OS threads. Like the logical connections are very light, lightweight, just like user mode threads are very lightweight to, to OS threads, but they're still kind of giving you the same level of abstraction. Um, I think I'm running really long on time, but that's a really quick example of what the API looks like. All right, um, the downsides of that, are that, so the downsides of actually doing this instead of using, of, of doing stream multiplexing instead of actually using physical connections, it's, it's a little slower. Um, the multitasking in your kernel and, and, the, and your actual hardware, the drivers for Nix is, is much better at, at doing that. So you're definitely gonna sacrifice some performance doing this. Um, it's not standardized. Uh, I'm hoping eventually to, to standardize what I wrote as like a, a this is what a stream multiplexing uh, protocol should look like. It's just the bare minimum for what you need to do stream multiplexing. Um, and the other kind of uh, difficult part about it, the other kind of downside of it is that it suffers from a problem called head of line blocking, which is the basic idea is if you have multiple TCP connections open and you lose packets on one of them, all of the other connections can proceed as normal. With this situation, if you have a single connection and you're actually running multiple streams over it, if you lose a packet on the single physical stream, like all of your logical streams are blocked. Uh, the, some people far smarter at me at Google are working on a protocol called Quick, which aims to solve that by actually providing what SCTP kind of wanted to give you, but without, but actually would work on the public internet. So, if you have this, if you have this power to actually like create public endpoints to listen on from a library, like what can you do with it? You can start decentralizing the web. The applications that you build, in addition to listening on local ports, should also be able to, with an option, listen on a public port, right? On a, on a public address, uh, just with a simple command line switch that's built into the application so that people, who, that people can run it on like any, any device that's connected to the internet uh, can run any application, including services. So the first service that I built um, to demonstrate this, I built this library, I was like, man, I really want to test it out, is a simple file server. Uh, you guys have used like Python simple HTTP server or something like that. It's just like that, except it works publicly. So just for example, like if you wanted to see the source code for this, um, I have this command called serpter. Uh, it, this basically just takes the, the tunnel that's been opened and it passes it to Go's uh, file serving, uh, the NetHTV file server. So you actually go to that address, all of you can actually download the, the example code that I wrote for this. Um, it's available on that address. I guess I should provide like a, a nice one for you. So um, let's do like 
on GoSF. So if you go to gosf.serger.net, you can download the example code for the presentation. And yeah, uh, moving forward, I want to standardize these protocols. I want to standardize the protocol for, for stream multiplexing. I want to standardize uh, the protocol for establishing tunnels so that these things can be built in other languages. I want to build a C implementation and uh, bindings into other languages so that projects in every language, not just Go, can build this in so that I can talk to Notch and the Minecraft team and tell them, like, here's your Java API. Um, just add this call and uh, your, your Minecraft servers will be able to serve on public endpoints for anyone to run out of their home. If you like, so the other kind of thing is like, there are more situations than just NATs uh, that you might want to, that you can't get out of that, that don't have public addresses um, or things that are NATs but aren't typically thought of them, like not your like home, your router at home is a NAT, but there are other ones uh, that are giving me ideas about other things to build. So those are some of them. Hi, Heroku people. I'm running TCP, public TCP servers on you. <laughs> Embedded devices, things that you like, thermostats maybe, that you put into other people's homes but don't control the networks to. You just give them a connection to the wireless network and then suddenly they have a public endpoint. Those are the, the links to the libraries on GitHub. I'm incontrovable on the internets. Uh, all right, thank you. Great stuff.